Oh, so, uh, okay, good. Okay, let's begin. <clears throat> Greeting and welcome to the second session of the exclusive five-part lecture series titled The Human Condition, a Buddhist perspective presented by Dr. Louis Lancaster, organized by the Religious Study Department at the University of West. I'm Miro Sake, a chair of the Religious Study Department. Today, I'm delighted and privileged to present our esteemed guest lecturer, Professor Louis Lancaster. The topic of today's lecture is Human Condition, a Buddhist Perspective. The persistent message of illness. People sometimes say that Buddhism is pessimistic when they hear the first noble truth, life is suffering. But the Buddha was simply being realistic and honest about the human condition. Since all of us will face these experiences at one time and another during our life, the Buddha was upfront about them so we can start right now, learn to respond wisely when they occur. It is a natural part of the human life circle. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Duncan. Thank you very much, Maroj, uh, and hello to everybody. <clears throat> this is the second in our lecture series on the persistent message of illness. <clears throat> One, one of the most beloved stories in Buddhism is that of the four messengers who greet a youthful Shakyamuni as he rides his chariot through the city. Now, during this event, he comes in contact with illness, the first messenger. And before the startled prince's gaze, a very sick person lay on the street, moaning in agony. Now the young man, repulsed by what he saw, could not readily accept the reality of illness as an integral part of the human life. And yet this disturbing vision was a crucial aspect of his preparation to fulfill his destiny as a Buddha. Well, um, like Shakyamuni, we have had to face illness that shocked our emotions and our concept of the social fabric. <clears throat> COVID came upon us at a time when our technology had transformed and empowered science. In the years before 2020, uh, we could feel we were doing a pretty good job of handling life. In retrospect, it was a golden era of travel, global commerce, advances in medical surgery and treatments, a digital revolution that had transformed communication and management of ideas and data. We we took it all for granted, <laughs> and it's only now that we realize what a treasured time it was. Our messenger of illness, that is COVID, has been especially harsh and unrelenting. It would not let us just brush it aside any more than Shakyamuni could ignore his messenger of illness we could not retreat to the comfort of denial as deaths mounted and hospitals filled beyond their capacity. It was necessary to go into isolation, shut down business, close offices, empty airports, and even force schools to limit instruction to the internet. The message? we must not forget the fragility of our human condition. All of us can at any moment be subject to the forces of nature over which we have little or no control. Now in this case, with all of our technology, we were able to do something that has never happened in a pandemic we quickly developed vaccines 
that slowed the spread, lessened the effects of the disease. However, the microbe was not so easily erased. Our relief to have a vaccine was soon tempered by the news that with millions of infected people, the microbe was undergoing rapid mutation. Those mutants were different enough to challenge the effectiveness of vaccines, and COVID continued to respread once again around the globe. Now, whether from South Africa, New Jersey, London, or China, mutations are still killing thousands and creating for some long-term health conditions. As Mark Twain said, we have to be taught over and over to be human. In other words, we have to be taught over about our human condition. Now, Shakyamuni lived a privileged life with youthful health, and it pains him to learn that illness comes to us all. And like him, we don't want to hear bad news. It's very striking that when the 1918 flu receded, few spoke of it or tried to remember what it was like. And yet, even a hundred years later, we take an annual flu shot to deal with mutations that date back to 1918 and beyond. Thus far, I have only found one film that depicts what happened when COVID closed our normal life for a period of time. It seems we don't want to watch the experience replayed in drama. We want to forget it ever happened. There's a current movement to erect a memorial to all of those who have perished from COVID. We have thousands of memorials to wars, battles, famous people. And I, I just wonder how a memorial to COVID will be accepted. It is always difficult as well to hear the message of the first great truth taught by the Buddha. That is the truth there is suffering, dissatisfaction. And when we want to have an unmoving target for our vaccines, it's equally sad to hear that nothing is in permanent form. Everything is in constant flux, and this includes microbes as well as our human condition. So what are we to learn from this? What is the response that we can make to the fearsome prospect of constant change that can bring with it unwanted effects? Now, some of the canonic texts tells us, tell us that when we fully understand these aspects of the human condition, one response can be compassion, compassion for all living beings. When we meet someone at the checkout stand at the grocery store, we can remember that they are like us in being subject to the human conditions. If we can have this thought with every person we contact, our first impulse will be a kind of deep sorrow that they, like us, are struggling in the stormy sea of human life. To fully understand this moment, we have to first accept our own place in the human condition. Unless we know that we are like all other beings in this condition, <clears throat> there can never be compassion. Compassion can only be with equals, with someone who has the same pain as ourselves. 
I know that I can feel pity for a blind person, but since I've never been blind, I'm not able to fully comprehend what it's like to be blind. But the message of illness is so powerful because we are all potentially subject to it. And we understand the discomfort of a high fever, aches, or nausea. Now, health workers live with the anguish of illness. There's nothing so comforting as a kind word from a nurse or a doctor when faced with illness. To hear one of them say, just try to relax. I'm here and I will take good care of you. Well, when we think that the illness has passed and that we have immunity, it's easy to slip back into a state of complacency, the very opposite of compassion. When we are ill and recover our health, it does not mean that the human condition of illness has been overcome. Living beings are subject to illness in every moment, every day. Once I am recovered and have no symptoms, I tend to just return to my life and seldom think of the unpleasant moments. But we know that microbes are always with us, and the illnesses caused by them are no means conquered by our present technology. Yes, we have to face the microbes are indeed persistent. Now, the Buddha has been likened to a physician. His task was first to diagnose the illnesses of people around him. Only then could he be effective in giving a cure. The Prajnaparamita text repeats that one of the meanings of Dharma is knowledge about the way things really are. Thus, whoever teaches in accord with the way things really are is a teacher of Dharma. And so with illness, we need the Dharma to tell us the way things really are. Now at times we fear the message and we live in denial of symptoms. And when we do so, it often results in long-term suffering or even death. I came to understand the importance of knowing the way things really are. Some years ago, I began to suffer from repeated episodes of pneumonia. And my trips to the clinics resulted in no clear knowledge of what was occurring. Finally, after the fourth case of pneumonia, I met a bodhisattva in the form of a doctor who looked for the Dharma, looked for the way things are. She refused to give any medication until she had a diagnosis. And even when the lab reported after a week of testing my specimen that they could find nothing, she asked them to do a rare extra week of repeating the test. It was only then that with DNA, they identified the microbe that was causing my repeated illness and could give me an antibiotic that worked. Well, as you see, I recovered thanks to her. Now this taught me that the Buddha was a very wise doctor. Before teaching anyone, he searched for the cause, the illness, the ignorance that was blinding his listeners. When the Buddha did his diagnosis of his audience, and sought to learn the nature of their sickness, he gave us the result of his research. 
he reported that in, in addition to microbes, he found a different kind of illness in the human condition. Illness that could not be cured with herbs. These illnesses are like poison. There are three of these major illnesses that infect us. This is the illness brought on by the three poisons, greed, hate, delusion. Much of the teachings preserved in the Buddhist canons deal with how to remove the malady of these three poisons, these three illnesses. Now, as we look back on those fearful days of the early COVID and the reaction of people, it is clear that in our human condition, we not only suffered from a microbe, we also suffered from the presence of the three poisons. In one way, the battle with COVID turned from trying to control a microbe to a fierce battle to have power and control over humans. The poison of greed showed itself in the desire to have full control over others, to be the one with the power. It showed itself whenever we stubbornly held to ideas, not for the sake of health or healing, but for our own sense of being right and of having worth. I think the poison of hatred could be detected in our anger that dominated our actions whenever we felt that others were not responding to our needs and wishes. And the poison of delusion drove us to resist the acceptance of the way things are and instead acting as if our projections of reality are the same as reality. So part of the tragedy of COVID has been the continued presence of the three poisons, even as we had vaccines and medicines to treat the microbial disease. As, as I thought about this lecture and the potential for becoming involved in the angers and even hatred that seems to mark every action, whether it be wearing a mask or getting vaccinated or avoiding contact, it seems to me that three poisons are fully at play amongst us. I, I've had to realize something about myself. I have to recognize that I got caught up in living with the poisons as the only way to deal what, with what was happening. I, I had anger and fear and rejection and was rigid in my assurance of knowing the way to handle life. How easy it has been to fall into rejecting other opinions to deny people any right to their own thinking. How easy to dismiss them with the thought that their position has no merit. How difficult to have a generosity of spirit that can still relate to someone who has opposite views. Fortunately, I had a wise teacher in my life, my sister. She showed me by example that it is possible to live in our present time without relying on the three poisons. She reminded me that people for whom I have the deepest affection may hold views that are the opposite of my own. I had to look within myself and find the strength to continue loving the best in others, 
and not live in fear of what I consider to be their worst side. My sister urged me not to push people out of my heart. Now, it's, it's very difficult to give such a lecture, particularly when the world seems to offer only options of being either a progressive liberal or a right-wing conservative. How do I want to be seen in this environment? Which, which, which of the two sides identifies me? And as I contemplated these issues, there arose within me a fierce feeling. I want to be seen and I only want to teach as a human. I want to have focus that includes all of us with whatever our beliefs. I want to see all as my fellow human beings, not identified by concepts. How wonderful any moment when <clears throat> one or more of the three poisons is removed. But I'm embarrassed to look back and see how easy it has been to fall into rejecting other opinions, to deny people any right to their own thinking, how easy to dismiss them with the thought that their position has no merit, how difficult it is to have a generosity of spirit that can still relate to someone who has opposite views. <clears throat> the inventory of my feelings and reactions, but let me see how difficult it is to appreciate someone who seems to dislike me and reject me. And then came a question I've never asked before. Is it possible that I can accept that someone may not like me? but I can like them? Is it possible that I can even like them without trying to change them or get them to like me? Is this what's meant by generosity? Is this the antidote to the poison of greed? It is also perhaps the most difficult but important way to practice loving kindness when faced with hatred. I think of this as reacting to another as a human. This is a practice that may be totally internal. It's not necessarily put forth in public to garner praise or to show how superior we are. I know this can sound very impractical and can be seen even as abandoning my ethical beliefs. My only suggestion is that in a most private way, I can hold to my principles without the need to attack another. I can try to heal myself, even as the pandemic of the three poison erupts all around me. Once I stop using the three poisons, can I work for what I believe to be important, perhaps with even greater strength? My ability to deal with the three poisons will be so much more effective to the degree that I can remove them in my thoughts, in my emotions, my immediate reactions. In medicine, there can be no cure that does not come to grips with the cause. Now, we sometimes use poison to treat a disease such as cancer. That should remind us that even one of the poisons does not have the nature of always being destructive. Sometimes anger gives us the energy we need. 
but pure anger is only a momentary reaction to an event. It is so often replaced by our thoughts and deeply embedded reactions, and we keep anger alive long after it has any merit. We need the skill to make use of the totality of our condition. That skill involves the way in which we deal with illness. Whether it's caused by a microbe, a misfunction of my body, or by adverse effects of poisons, both physical and mental. I promise myself from here on to take special delight in any day when I have a sense of wellness. I promise myself to, if possible, fully to live with those experiences and not be unconscious of these moments of wellness. Now, my persistent messenger of illness will always be there. But I would like to use the message to remind me to treasure those positive feelings and live my life as fully as I possibly can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lou. Uh, we appreciate your exceptional and moving lecture about the persistence message to, of illness. Our question answer session will now commence. Uh, we kindly request that you type your question in the chat box. Uh,